right. And also uh, just a reminder to turn off your camera. Um, Paul. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Hello? Hello? Kim, I can still hear you. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, for some reason, it. Uh, okay, no. let's, let's give it another go. All right, take two. All right, there and just kind of mute your microphone and turn off your camera so that'll save us on some bandwidth. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started today, guys. Excuse um, me. Today Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Can you please tell me where I can find the message window in the toolbox because I cannot find it? Oh, okay. So um, there is a box um, that looks like a, it, it's right. You see where the hand, is there a box that you see raise your hand? It should be right next to that. It looks like a quote box. Yes, I, I, I was in the class yesterday. Today, unfortunately, I don't see that. Oh, okay. Um, um, Paul, this is Brandy. Uh, sometimes ahead. when people attend, they don't have the chat box available. The trick that seems to work is to exit the meeting, then come right back in. And for some reason, the chat box appears. Right on. Thank you. I'll see you guys in a bit. I'm so sorry, Kim. Thank you. Oh, that's all right. Yeah, it's all right. Um, all right. Okay, here we go, guys. Take two, take three. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about fall vegetable gardening. Um, I'm going to try to take some questions throughout. Uh, my my hosts are going to answer some questions as well in the chat box as we kind of go through fall vegetable gardening presentation. Today I wanted to cover uh, a few of the things that I think are critical to critical to know when you're starting your fall vegetable garden. Um, next month, I will focus specifically on the vegetable varieties. So today we'll talk more about the preparation of the garden, which is actually you start preparing uh, for your fall vegetable garden in the summer. So let's get started. So how do you know when it's time to pull up your summer crops and get ready for the fall? when your plants start to look like this. These are my two tomato plants. Um, and they're just, they've just about had it. There's not enough water I can keep on them. The sun is beating them down. I think we had a, a heat index uh, this week of 110 and my tomatoes are just crying. They're saying, okay, we've had enough. Go ahead and harvest and get that soil ready for the fall. All right, so we're going to cover today seven key things uh, for starting your fall vegetable gardens. There's going to be five critical things all plants need. We're going to cover your space and how to sketch out a design to get ready for your fall gardens. Okay, within that, you're going to determine the location if that space that you've sketched out is in full sun, part sun, shade, uh, or part part sun, part shade, depending on the summer, uh, the summer, the fall sunlight, or what have you, in your different areas. And are you next to water? So is the water hose somewhat near, or are you having to carry water buckets to water your garden each time you give it some water? Okay, we're going to talk about creating a, a list of vegetables for the fall, the soil conditions, the growing habits of each of those vegetables. Um, if you're going to start off with seeds or transplants, which is really important, guys, um, often we read those grow charts and we say, hey, I can start a cauliflower from seed and you get the package of seeds and it takes forever for those cauliflower seedlings to uh, break dormancy. Um, a little bit about pests and insects who attack those fall crops. 
Uh, one of the most important things with gardening is the soil preparation. Without the appropriate uh, balance of, of nutrients within the soil, something's going to be wrong with your garden. Okay, you're, it's just not going to turn out the way that you want typically. So we're going to talk about using chemicals uh, and to begin with the most environmentally friendly chemicals first, compost, and understanding chemicals, okay, and how to apply those properly. So let's, let's get going. So the five things all plants need are sunlight or some type of light. I mean, whether it's a grow light, uh, something that you have, but the plants need that light for photosynthesis. You're going to need water, okay? All plants need water. Water carries the different nutrients to where it needs to go, nourishes those roots. Um, you need air. So think about some of the funguses that we get during the summer. Um, you want to actually have air that goes through not only the soil, but goes through the plants as well, uh, whether it be breeze, a breeze, just something that kind of blows through the leaves. Proper drainage. So you'll want proper drainage, um, especially if you're planting rhizomes, things of that nature. You don't want the water to sit in your soil. It'll end up rotting out your bulbs. This is really important. <clears throat> when you think about planting things like garlic, which takes so long to grow. I mean, you plant the, the bulbs during the winter, but you're not harvesting until the summer. So without proper drainage, it just kind of rots out those, it can rot out those bulbs. And of course, nutrients. All plants need nutrients, whether you're growing in ground, the containers, you'll need those nutrients, which is why, and the, and the plants take them up pretty quickly, which is why you can start in the summer with the whole uh, container full of soil and then closer towards the end of the summer, uh, about half of that soil is, is depleted, it's gone. All right, so the first thing I like to do each year is I create a sketch you want to create a sketch of your garden and I like to make copies. So what you see here is uh, from one of my previous gardens and I just kind of created a sketch of what I wanted to grow, what I want to plant that year. And I also write down, um, I take little notes on how well that particular variety did for me. Uh, what you can't see here is I also make a note on where I purchased those seeds from. Um, where you purchase your seeds from is very important as well. Uh, some companies will let you know uh, the germination rate. So if, say if you get some seeds and they have a 50% germination rate, well that might be okay uh, for uh, someone who has access to large acreage it's a hobby that you've grown, but in the city, uh, real estate is at a premium and I need a, a, a good germination rate for those seeds, okay? And that's usually um, older seeds as well don't tend to germinate as quickly. All right, so a few of the varieties that we can plant in the fall, and I'm gonna kinda go through them uh, a little quickly here. So the first one we have is cabbage. Cabbage you start in the fall. I would, it does well if you seed it directly in the soil, but you need to do that sooner rather than later, or you can start off with uh, little transplants. If you wanna start your transplants, uh, probably within the next week or so, you should have a nice size plant to actually put in your soil. Uh, beets, direct sow, cauliflower, I would start from transplants. Tomatoes, some people say, eh, I don't grow tomatoes in the fall. I get my best tomatoes in the fall, okay? Because remember, tomatoes need that cooler temperature at night 
in order to uh, to create the tomatoes. Um, I also get a few less insects during the fall than I do the spring. I'm not sure why, but tomatoes, that's tomatoes. Carrots, <clears throat> you always want to sow those directly in the soil. Um, carrots do not transplant well. Uh, lettuces, lettuces are pretty easy to grow. You just sprinkle those um, in the soil uh, and, and thin them out if you don't have them spaced out correctly. Okay, you grow, in the fall we can grow all the greens, the kales, the mustard greens, the collard greens, turnip greens. Now just take note, if you're trying to grow things like uh, turnip greens, you want to make sure that there's enough spacing between the plants because depending on the size of the turnips, if you're growing them for the greens or the turnips, that'll determine uh, the, the spacing that you want to receive. Okay, squash. So there's the summer squash and winter squash. And winter squash you actually start in the summer. Summer squash you actually start in the spring. You might be able to get one more flush of the summer uh, squash, but it's going to be difficult because right about now uh, it's hot, guys, and the temperatures just continue to get a little bit hotter. <laughs> So getting those plants to germinate and do what you needed to do very quickly might be a little tricky. Garlic. Garlic, you actually start to order your garlic bulbs in the fall to plant in the winter. So if you wait until the winter to order your garlic, a lot of the varieties, which I've noticed, are sold out. So go ahead and start thinking about your garlic and what you actually want to order now. Broccoli, I would go with transplants. Um, it takes a long time to grow. Sugar snap peas are pretty pretty easy, direct sow. Leeks, same, same deal. Leeks can take a little bit of time. Um, I would start planting those right now. Pumpkins, right now. Pumpkins, actually, uh, a lot of crops are all, have already been planted. Um, I, I would plant pumpkins in the summer if you want to get them for the fall. And, of course, uh, sweet potatoes, which the leaves are edible, so you should have already kind of ordered those varieties. And you're actually harvesting the sweet potatoes closer to the winter, um, which you plant them in the summer. All right. So take time to learn about the vegetable family, um, whether it's nightshades, which, you know, that's part the tomatoes, the potatoes, eggplants and peppers, the legumes, the cucurbits, grasses, mallows, morning glories, and goosefoots. I'm not going to go through each, uh, each type, but what this does is it helps you learn about the plant's growing habits and the pests and insects that attack um, specific varieties. So, for example, if you're planting your tomato next to the potato, you might have the same type of, you might be encouraging the same type of pest to attack that uh, particular uh, variety, okay? Um, this is also important um, for root, root knot nematodes uh, that get in the soil and they kind of destroy crops from the soil on up. So we don't, in the city per se, we don't have enough room typically to rotate our crops. But if you can, if a tomato is there in the fall, I would switch it with a different type of plant just to let, just to rotate the nutrients that are in the soil because one thing may really take up uh, one type of nutrients while another plant, say for example, uh, okra, which isn't too picky, you know, it can handle some, some pretty, um, 
nutrient <laughs> lacking soils. Okay. All right. So begin with good quality, reputable. Uh, take a look at some of the reputable catalogs, reputable local retailers who, who sell seeds, uh, saved seeds from open pollinated sources. So if you saved your seeds, say from heirloom seeds, then you can typically replant those seeds and it'll come back from those saved seeds. Hybrids, uh, not the case. Sometimes people are able to save their hybrids and replant them, but they might not come back true to form. Uh, check out new varieties. New varieties are so much fun. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of heirloom varieties probably a larger fan when I have more space, but I want vegetables and I need them to come up and I need to show results now. So I lean a little bit towards the hybrids and the new varieties um, that have been tried through uh, different trial gardens. So determine seed or plant, which you're gonna start with, okay? You have your sketch down, you've written down the list of varieties that you want to grow and now you need to determine do i want to start this from seed or plant um i should mention that typically the larger the seed the easier uh, the germination process is the smaller the seeds they they tend to have a struggle a little bit with the germination process so i always over plant the seeds so say if you want seven plants, I would start off with at least 14 seeds and just kind of thin them out as they, they come up. So I listed a couple varieties that I would start from seeds. So the broccoli, cauliflower, um, peppers. I wrote down peppers because peppers I start in the winter and to have a fall pepper plant because that's how long those pepper plants tend to take from seed. Um, tomatoes, you can get those started right now uh, in containers and then transplant. Um, you do not want to direct sow tomatoes right now in the heat of the summer. Okay, and this is just a, another list of the families, vegetable families continued. So dandelion, parsley, uh, the goosefoot, lily, which is some of these, depending on where you live, uh, grow well. Uh, for example, the asparagus. I've tried and tried in Houston, and they just don't seem to like our heat and humidity. Whereas when I go back home to Colorado, they're doing just fine, okay? Uh, and the brassicas. So take special note of the brassicas. Those are primarily what most of us lean towards during the fall. Okay. So know the good guys, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So right about now, if you've already started your, uh, your squash and you're not keeping a good eye on it, this guy is out there, okay? And it's a squash vine borer. And this is, if you, it, it's actually an attractive insect, believe it or not, but it's horrible. It's a horrible, horrible bug. <laughs> okay. It lays uh, seeds on the stems of your squash. The seeds, the, the eggs, I should say. The eggs are about the size, a little bit bigger than grains of black pepper. And they hatch and those larvae burrow inside your squash plant and they eat it from the inside out. Um, and then your plant is pretty much toast. I mean, there's different ways, but it's difficult. But I can't tell you how hurtful it is to actually 
select your variety, start from transplant, get it in the ground, and then this guy comes around and kind of devastates the crop. So if you see those on your stem, you just kind of pop them off with your fingernail um, and take note, okay? I'm gonna put all those out there. Okay, so a few common diseases and in insects. So in the fall, we get powdery mildew. One of the ways that people get powdery mildew is you're watering at night instead of the day. I mean, it, different things can cause it, but what I've seen the most is watering it, watering the leaves during the night, the temperatures drop, and you know you catch a fungus or this powdery mildew on the bottom here the squash vine borer you can see the larvae and that's kind of eating the plant from the inside out um aphids are horrible during the fall and in the summer as well so take care of the aphids usually if you have ants you have aphids so if you can take care of your red ants um because they kind of mine the aphids if you will the aphids basically uh, secrete uh, a honeydew type of uh, they poop honeydew <laughs> the the red ants like the 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 sweet honeydew so they kind of protect the aphids so if you can take care of the ants you can kind of take care of the aphids. Um, that's just one way. Uh, juvenile squash bugs, you see them and they gather. If you can see them and they gather on your tomato plants like that, if you can take your gloves and just kind of squish it or get something and smash them and get as many as you can, you really cut back on having those horrible squash, squash bugs that Suck, your, suck the life out of your tomatoes and other crops, okay? I'm going to bring all of these up at once for the sake of time. Okay, so lace wings. Lace wings are some of my favorite. They have um, the, the larvae have a voracious appetite, as do the larvae of the, the ladybugs. And take note of the larva of the ladybugs because when I first seen the larva many years ago, I had no idea if it was a good guy or a bad guy and I was thumping them off with my finger. I, sh I should have done some research before, but I, I had no idea. So notice the lace wings, uh, they lay their eggs on bark or uh, maybe on a leaf and they're just really fine looking uh, eggs and of course the lace wings they can be either a brown in color but they're typically green and their wings look like lace these are all good guys okay the bronchonoid wasp on the bottom as you can see um, he's a good guy and he lays his eggs on top of that's a tomato hornworm and again it it hatches and it eats that tomato hornworm from the inside out. Okay, so all of these do something that will be beneficial for your garden. And I should say most insects in the garden are beneficial. Okay, so do a little research and study before you uh, kind of take different insects out. All right, so understanding your plant growth. <coughs> So this is a, a garden and one of the things about your garden is when you start to see your plants come up, I like to lay newspaper down and then mulch. And one of the reasons why is when I water those plants, I don't get the splash from the soil onto the leaves, which again causes fungus. And if you can see by this uh, cucumber plant here on the left hand side all the weeds are starting to come up and that helps uh, to tear some of the weeds that come up as well as pests and other things also makes it look uh, nice and pretty 
All right. So soil, soil, it's all about your soil. The best thing I've done for my garden is homemade compost. If you haven't started a pile, uh, it, it's so worth it, guys. I can't tell you how worth it, it is to start your own homemade compost. Um, if you're, if you have a new raised bed garden, it typically takes the soil about a season to become acclimated and all the microbes to work together and get that some symbiotic balance to give you a powerhouse of nutrients. Um, if you have established raised bed gardens from my seasoned gardeners who are on the, the call as well, you know that you're adding stuff to your gardens as well each season because again the plants take up those nutrients i found it very helpful for the in-ground gardens so when i do uh, buy containers and put my containers say in a, a specific spot if you're not in a a, a townhome or apartment where your containers unconcrete if you have access to soil <coughs> I leave the bottom open and that way the earthworms can find my uh, my soil and they kind of work their way up within the the container All right any questions for me Brandy or Paul um, no, not, no really. not really okay I, we, uh, we've, been we've been posting the links, the links. Um, Paul do you want to do the hand raises <laughs> Uh, yes, we can do that. So, uh, let's see. The first one I see is, uh, Jeannie Trippy. Do you want to put your mic on and ask your question, please? Well, Paul, I didn't, I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it's, it's, it, it's showing that your hand's raised. Okay. So okay. That, that's fine. You can take, I'll go down to the next one then. Um, Sue, you had your hand raised. You can turn your mic on and ask your question. Yes, Paul, I did. But this was only about seedlings. I was just curious about how often to water seedlings. Um, I would just keep the soil moist. Um, depending on where you have your seedlings, if they're in direct sun or, you know, part sun, part shade, I would probably just give it, uh, depending on your container, maybe a little, a little bit of water every other day. And I water, I typically water mine from the bottom uh, as opposed to the top, if you can, if it's in a little container where you can water the bottom and then that water just kind of soaks up from the bottom. I did that yesterday and I was amazed how it just soaked it up. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, guys. So uh, I'm going to come back to questions here for the sake of time. So we're going to talk a, a little bit about compost. And I'm not bad mouthing the compost that's out there by no means. Okay, get it where you can. But your homemade compost is going to have so much life that... I mean, some of the, we call it gold, <laughs> okay? Black gold, because it's so valuable and it'll be, value. it's a, a valuable enhancer to your soil, okay? So these are a few of the things that you can compost. You can compost hair. Yes, the hair on your head, not your, your animal's hair from cats or dogs. If you don't have a lot of chemicals or a lot of dye, uh, you can compost that. Synthetic fertilizers, no. You don't want to compost synthetic fertilizers. I've found that uh, synthetic fertilizers tend to bind some of the nutrients in my soil um, when I put it in the compost. So sawdust from treated wood, no. Untreated wood, yes. Fingernails, yes. Leaves, absolutely. So that's where you're going to get probably the bulk of your compost are from leaves. Cat or uh, dog or cat waste, no. 
Grass clippings, yes, but you want to be careful with your grass clippings. Uh, make sure it doesn't go to seed because that can be quite painful. If you cut the grass, it's went to seed, you put it in your compost, and all of a sudden you have this beautiful, beautiful lawn growing up through your compost pile. You don't want to do that. Uh, leaves, again, yes. Citrus peels and onion peels, you want to use those sparingly, okay? You don't want to use a lot of those. Glossy and coated paper, no. Uh, fish or meat scraps, no. Weed seeds, no. Produce scraps, absolutely yes, okay? And I should say with the citrus and onion peel, you can use a little bit of it, but just <clears throat> kind of very sparingly, uh, for different reasons. And of course, coffee and tea bags, yes. All right, so just take a quick look at this, guys. What not to compost and why? Uh, people say, well, why can't I compost synthetic, synthetic fertilizers? And this, are, this is the actual reason why. And we're gonna have this slide on our YouTube uh, page where you can go back and watch this if you want. I'll put the, the link at the end of this. Um, glossy paper, meats, onions, citrus, and pet, pest waste. Okay. All right. So understanding plant growth, understanding what you're trying to grow, leaves, bulbs, or roots. Okay. What do the numbers mean? The numbers on the bags are really important. They're nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Often we see these numbers and we're like, what in the world does this mean? You know, everybody knows that the first number is nitrogen. This is important if you're trying to grow things like collard greens and mustard greens. You want that leaf to grow. You want it big and beautiful and pretty uh, Things for things like kale as well. Okay, so the primary nutrients for nitrogen, it helps with cell growth and development. It keeps your leaves nice and green, promotes rapid vegetation, increases seed and tuber yield and crop quality. When you don't have enough nitrogen, uh, your leaves may appear older in some parts. The plants kind of yellow uh, they, they're slow to grow. Sometimes they, they purple a little bit or brown. Poor growth. Plants are spindly and prone to wilting. Roots are overly large and they are all susceptible to diseases and fungus as well as bad insects. Okay, so phosphorus. The role in the plant for phosphorus is it helps with photosynthesis, okay? Storing carbohydrates, uh, early plant establishment, the formation and quality of flowers, fruit, and seeds. If you are deficient in phosphorus, um, the plants tend, it tends to show an older tissue, kind of this reddish purpling, as you can see from the leaf. Uh, the foliage becomes dull blue, green, and your growth is slow. Okay, the very last number, potassium. So it helps regulate water in the cells. Okay, uh, helps with the cell strengthening, helps with photosynthesis, uh, the formation and storage, of, helps with fruit quality, increases resistance to stress, um, if you're deficient in potassium, you'll have poor growth, leaf burn, spotting, molting on the lower leaves. Lower leaves may show red pigmentation. Okay, that's if you're deficient in potassium. So a few of those resources for the, the primary, for the nitrogen and the phosphorus are bat guano, blood mill, cottonseed mill, poultry mix um, for phosphorus, bone mill, uh, fish mill. And I should also say for the nitrogen, 
uh, liquid. So my two go-tos are liquid seaweed. You can find that at any big box store and liquid fish emulsion or what I use in combination with my compost. Okay, so fertilizers, the difference between a slow release and a fast release. Fertilizers are either water soluble or water insoluble. Basically, if you use, say, a synthetic fertilizer, if you, as you can see in the chart, what that does, the you know, it, it requires water, you got to give it water, and it jumps up, and it kind of gives you that wow factor <clears throat> very quickly. This is good if you say you have a school garden and you need to show results quickly, as opposed to the, the image on the right-hand side. Well, I shouldn't say as opposed. This is more of a slow-release fertilizers. These are more natural fertilizers. You water them a little less. Um, things will tend to break down naturally, and it's a more steady growth, okay? So understanding plant growth, so on the left-hand side, you can see different characteristics. Um, so with the compared to the slow release as opposed to the quick release fertilizers, the response time, slow, quick, burn potential is high with some of those synthetic fertilizers. Uh, application for some of the synthetics, you need to put them down more frequently. Um, okay, they need the water. Um, this is kind of an, an old chart, <laughs> but it's saying the cost of the product. I find that some of the natural stuff is actually getting up there and costs. <laughs> so it costs just as much as the some of the other uh, synthetic product products. So the leach leaching potential it does leach out into some of our streams rivers things like that the slow release does as well just a little bit slower and maybe not uh, the products may be not as harmful for surface runoff environmentally friendly the slow release stuff typically a little bit more environmentally friendly than the fast released Okay, so if you want to take a look at any of our previous talks before, we've started a YouTube page. All our videos are on there. So you can, I was trying to make it where the link is live and you can click on it. If not, just do a Google search for Texas A&M AgriLife Extension YouTube page and join us. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. Um, find me on Facebook. We post all of our events on there to, mm -hmm. to learn about different other educational lectures. So uh, without any further ado, any questions, Brandy? Uh, not in the chat, but Paul can uh, take the hand raises. I, I okay. will say also that... Um, your particular video will go out to the people who registered for this also. Okay. So, so get, they'll get, have the link in the email. Okay. Okay. I've got a few hand raises here. So, uh, Sarah Singer, uh, if you can turn your mic on and ask your question, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I did that on accident, so I don't actually have a question. Sorry about okay. that. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Tristan, your hand is up. Hi. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm a um, new gardener, and I guess my question is, if I didn't want to plant like directly into my soil that's in the backyard or plant directly into the ground, can I get um, a raised bin and start start there um, as far as the soil 
And would I have to wait a while before I plant or can I get, you know, the soil that you were talking about along with mixing it with those other different things to, um, to start planting? That's kind of my question. So, yes, absolutely. And kind of a funny story. I moved last year and the soil that I have here is no good. So right now I'm getting a, a planter for my backyard garden and I'm going to fill that up. I want to, I'm going to keep the bottom open for the earthworms and different things to find hopefully the nutrients. And then I'm going to layer that with, uh, leaves and soil and compost and a little bit of fertilizer and just kind of water that down before I plant my plants in there this fall. And I'm going to start off with things that I know will treat me right. So lettuces, kales, things of that nature don't require a lot of nutrients. Um, if I start off with things like Brussels sprouts, I'm going to get my heart broke <laughs> because they require, they take a long time and they typically require a lot of nutrients. So I would say if you're a new gardener, maybe go with things that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you get great big, huge spinach leaves, or if you get huge collard, collard, uh, collard greens, as long as you get some collard greens, that's a success. Okay. Uh, next up, um, Ashley, uh, if you can take your, uh, turn your mic on and ask your question. Thanks, Paul. Hi, Kimberly. Um, so I had a question about compost and warm castings. I know that we did that you really didn't talk about warm castings in here, but it was a question that I just thought of. Um, can you use those with each other? Or should it be one or the other? Um, I would absolutely mix them uh, together. And it's kind of like you're making, you're making a big cake. So it, that's the reference I like to use when you're uh, creating your, your raised bed. So you're kind of mixing all those things together. And the worms are going to find your compost which is why I like to leave the bottoms open so you don't have to continually buy those expensive bags of worm castings uh, for your raised bed gardens, if you can. You know, not everybody can, and they have to have those closed containers. But yes, mix your compost with your worm castings. It's all good, good stuff. Wonderful, thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Okay, uh, next up would be, I believe it is Chiara Manton. Hi, that's Kiara. Thank you. I have two questions. I'm a beginner gardener, and I started gardening some veggies like a butternut squash, and I use, I bought a bag of the miracle Grow potty mix. Is that good or bad? What's like the consensus there? And my second question is red ants. Like, I noticed you mentioned it. How do I combat them? Okay, so uh, man, I, I hate red ants. So there's a, there's a couple ways. Many people have many different ways. There's no right, 100% right or 100% wrong. I can just tell you what I do. So during the, the springtime, I go and I purchase beneficial nematodes. I spray the beneficial nematodes throughout my grass and in my garden space. And what they do is they take care of the larva of the red ants. And I don't have red ants all year long. It, it knocks them out. Um, you can use some granulars as well for the red ants uh, to take care of that. And you were asking what your, I'm sorry, say that again with your butternut squash. So I'm a beginner and I just bought the, you know, the Home Depot uh, miracle Grow potting mix as oh, a, okay. as a soil. Okay. So what is, is that, how is that in the garden world? Is that uh, too chemically? Is it okay for a beginner? What's the consensus on that? Okay. So some people like it. Some people don't like it. It's all up to your, your personal taste. Um, Miracle Grow can tend to be one of those 
fast release fertile fast release elements yeah. that we talked about. So I'm an organic gardener personally, just because over time you're trying to build that soil and create that symbiotic balance with the nutrients that are there. And, uh, you know, miracle Grow might be just as good as well. It does bring those plants up fast that I've seen, but, you know, it's what you're trying to get long-term results, like the, the symbiotic balance where with my previous garden for years and years, I only used basically compost and, uh, some of the more natural uh, fertilizers uh, that were out there, cotton seed, uh, microlife, things like that for the fertilizer. Okay, thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, next up would be uh, Christina Stacy. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Yes, I have a question about when to plant tomato plants. I'm not interested in doing seeds. And you talked about not doing transplants right now in the heat, but how long can I wait before I would put a new tomato plant in for the fall? Okay, so typically I would plant my tomato plants sometime in September, right? The, the temperature is doing weird things on us now. It's getting just a little bit hotter. But if you could give it that morning sun, afternoon shade, and I would plant closer towards September, the beginning of September, and I usually go with a Roma or a cherry tomato because you have a shorter growing season in the fall for tomatoes. If you're going for beefsteaks, things like that, by the time that tomato turns red, you know, you may have caught uh, temperatures that are a little too cold before it actually matures. Thank you. You're welcome. I apologize for interrupting. I don't have hand raised or, or a comment section. So can I get in line for question? This is Sandra. Uh, sure. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I, I will just call on you, Sandra, as we work through this. No problem. Thank you very much. Okay, so next up Hello. would be Jane. Ex Jane? Excuse me. I'm the same way. I don't have a hand up. Could you put Lucinda Matrowski down there also for a hand up? Uh, Hi, this is Jane. Hi, good morning. I have two questions. One is I have an above ground compost turner. And um, so I, it's doing really, really well with um, new earthworms and um, my grandkids call it my earthworm farm. But is there thing as having too many earthworms in there? I don't want to overcrowd them or, or to go ahead and just start uh, uh, dipping a cup in there and uh, relocating them to some of my garden areas. And on my tomato plants that I had for the summer, on some of them that are quite tall and big, the bottom two thirds are looking quite straggly, scraggly and uh, not looking great. But the top third of these tomato plants are looking very healthy and very leafy. And is there a way that I can propagate these tomato plants from the greenery that's growing on the top rather than planting from seeds or buying transplants. Um, if the top of my big tall tomato plants are looking healthy, what's, uh, I, I hate to just chop down the whole thing if it's going to um, continue uh, declining for the rest of the summer. I'd love to save anything for future planting. Okay, so um, that might be a Paul question. Um, <laughs> I am not, sh I've never seen uh, it, uh, plant propagation from uh, the mature tomato plant from the top. Uh, I don't, well, I'm, I'm not sure. Paul, do you know? Kim? I would, um, there are, 
in, in the uh, greenhouse tomato production, many of those, well, usually all of those plants are not started from seed, but actually they are started, uh, they are grafted. Um, so they, the tops are one variety, the rootstock is, a, a, is, is different. Um, I, I would say, uh, give it a chance. Um, I'm, I'm, I would uh, assume that these will probably root for you rather quickly. Uh, they should root rather easily. I would get the younger, softer stems, not the thicker, hardier one. Um, but um, I have, I uh, likewise, I have not come across anybody that has taken cuttings off of their tomatoes and yeah. uh, and, and used them for a fall production. But <clears throat> um, give it a shot. Uh, Go uh, ahead. Uh, this is Jane Pfeffer. I'm Go a ahead, Jane. master gardener. Uh, I have uh, I have done that, um, and the part of the plant that you need to take is what we would call a sucker. Uh, okay. It's it's the part that comes up uh, between the main stem and uh, what we would just call a sun leaf because it doesn't produce tomatoes. It just gathers in sun to to help things grow. So if you take that sucker. Uh, and put it into uh, good potting soil and keep it moist, it will root and it will give you a plant for the fall. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, right. there you Thank go. You, Jean. Thanks, Jean. You're welcome. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Debbie Gear. Hi, good morning. Quick question on mulch. Um, you said to spread newspaper down and then mulch. What do you use for mulch? What material? Um, so I like to use the mulch that doesn't contain the dye. I'll use like a, a native mulch. Mm -hmm. And the thing about mulch, I put down the newspaper and it just helps kind of suppress the weeds. It allows me to define the space a little bit more. And at the end of the season, I'll push the mulch to the side because when you mix it into the soil, the soil will then begin to break up the mulch okay. and it'll focus on breaking up your mulch as opposed to growing your plants. Okay, yeah, that was my concern. So you just mulch around the plant, not the whole garden? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, next up would be Shannon. You can turn your mic on. So this last uh, spring, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I planted um, two uh, green pepper plants. They're about four feet tall. They get flowers. They look very healthy. They have nice green leaves and they haven't produced a pepper one. So should I pull them out? Do they need more time? It, are they okay in the heat? Um, I'm not sure what to do with them. Did I, did I need to have three of them? <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I am not sure, uh, for the, pe for the pepper plants. I mean, there's many different things you can do. You said the whole plant looks healthy. It's producing flowers. Are the flowers dropping off? Uh, not that I can see. Uh, they, they look white. They're not, um, like discolored or, or anything like that, but I, they just never produce peppers. Not a one. I would give it a little bit more time. Sometimes peppers can grow slow, uh, especially in the heat. My my peppers put on in the spring, but right now in this heat, heat, the 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 bell peppers are not producing. Um, the plant's still alive, so I know it will. I I think it it puts back on a little bit more during the fall. Um, bell peppers do like the heat, so it's not gonna kill your plant typically, but the ones that do uh, put on more are the, the smaller peppers, uh, jalapenos and things of that nature. But if you send me an email, I'll do a little bit more research and see if I can get a better answer to your question. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, Kim, it sounds like it, there might be a pollination issue um, so whether the bees aren't working the flowers or, um, because if she's, if she has good flower set, um, there, there's something must be wrong that, um, pollination isn't occurring. So that, that might be the challenge. Okay. Um, next up is, uh, Michelle.
Okay, Michelle is not there. Um, next up would be Pat. Going once, going twice. Okay, Neil. All right. Uh, how about Joseph Franchek? Yes, good morning. Um, I had a question with respect to getting your fall garden started. Um, I've seen a lot of planting charts, calendars out there, like the Texas AgriLife one, that kind of show you, you know, what time frame of what month you should plant each plant. Um, but it seems that that applies to when you want to put it outdoors in your garden. But I also read things like, um, for example, now you should be starting tomatoes and peppers inside from seed to be ready to transplant out there. Um, so I'm, I kind of struggle to know for the plants you want to start from seed indoors to be ready on those calendar dates outside, exactly where to find information on when to start each kind of vegetable. Is it just a matter of knowing each vegetable individually and knowing how much time and how big it would grow indoors before that outdoor planting time? You know, I would say, I, I believe the Harris County Master Gardeners, I think we have a planting guide that they updated uh, a couple years ago and they wrote down either seed or plant. I could be wrong, but I believe I saw that. But yeah, you guys have it. I, I use that one. Yeah, it has seed or transplant on it. Okay, okay. So if you can kind of take a look at that, that lets you know whether or not you want to start with seed outside or plant uh, to go outside and then just to make that sketch and write down the varieties that you want to grow. Knowing your varieties is going to be really important. Uh, you know, so if you're trying for uh, carrots, you're not trying to start those in pots and transplant them because carrots hate to be transplanted uh, as do corn and things of that nature. Yeah, the direct sow stuff seems to be pretty straightforward. Um, you just follow those planting guides like the ones I was mentioning. It was more for the seed ones, but you said the Texas Master Gardener has, that's where I can find a planting calendar with seed dates for indoor as well? Yes, Harris County. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead, Paul. Yeah, actually, yeah. it's it's on the um, Harris County website uh, under horticulture. There's a publications tab, and if you go to veggies, I think it's veggies, um, you'll see that planting calendar. And, and normally, when you want to start your own plants, um, pick the date that you want them to go into the ground, and then just count backwards. So normally, seed germination will take about um, seven to ten days um, you transplant and then it depends what size pot you want to grow it in I uh, normally I would give give it at least um, say six to eight weeks prior to it going in the ground um, now tomatoes will grow quickly for you um, if you want to start your own but um, I, I, I usually err on the side of giving it a little bit longer so if you count back eight weeks sow your seed and you should be able to hit your window then thanks all right um kim it is top of the hour kim we do have a few more hand hand hands raised um i would say um if you've got your questions kim's email address is right here kimberly.perry at ag.tamu.edu um so please, um, you can send your questions to her uh, about her presentation. Uh, Kim, I want to thank you again for your presentation, and I want to thank you all for joining us. This was a uh, one of our largest groups. I think we, we had some technical issues. I think more people wanted to get in, um, and we will work through that. We will get with our IT folks to find out what the issues were. But um, please, um, feel free to join us next week. Um, we will have an interesting topic by Brandy Keller uh, with re the Unique Eats. Uh, so, uh, again, thank you all for joining us, and uh, have a great day. All right. All right thanks, guys. <laughs> great job, quick, guys. Great job. 
Real Thank quick, you. this is Joe. Uh, as far as your IT issue goes, I know um, Teams has a max of 250 people for a meeting. Uh, so I think you went over that limit and anyone after 250 was not able to join. Okay, yeah, they, see, they, they told us that 250, um, they could be interactive with regard to being able to ask questions and raise their hand. But then that we were told that above 250, they would just be able to at least get on and listen. Um, but they wouldn't have the interactive. So that's one of the questions we've got to find out and, and uh, take care of that for the future. This is Marissa. I work for HISD and we've been using Teams a long time. Um, whenever we have a meeting that's larger than 250, we use the option of doing a live meeting. It's like a different type of meeting where people can still ask questions. So you might want to look into that as well. It's called a live meeting on Teams. OK, thank you. Thank you. That. Yep. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. Um, you know what, um, Kim, I don't know if uh, Brandy and um, Shannon are still on, yes. but I would like for us to, to get together here, um, say in about 15 minutes, um, because I'm sure everybody's got some comments. Um, so I think it might be helpful. All right, so we'll we'll click back on the link 15 minutes.